So far in this reproduction list, we were trying to understand measures. We started with sigma algebras, we moved on to measures, and in the last video, we found a way of defining measures from very simple functions called premeasures. And now we're going to focus on a very particular family of measures called Borel measures. That is, measures that are defined in the Borel sigma algebra. Now, if you don't remember what the Borel sigma algebra was, then check out one of the first videos we have in our reproduction list where we explain that in detail. So, a Borel measure is basically a measure mu defined in the Borel sigma algebra, and that gives us a number from 0 to infinity, so it's a measure. So, it has the three properties measures have to satisfy. But, like I said, in the last video, we saw how to create measures from pre measures. So, Borel measures will be defined from pre-measure. Let's suppose that we have a Borel measure mu, and that is finite. So, being finite, being finite means that the measure of the whole set, in this case we are working with the real numbers, is finite. Now, this applies obviously for the Borel measures over Rn, but for now we're just gonna focus on the real numbers. And let's say that given this measure, we define a function f of x as the measure of the interval minus infinity x, closed in x and open obviously in minus infinity. Now, fun fact, this function f is actually called the distribution function for the measure mu. That's a concept that comes from probability theory. So it can be proven I'm not going to prove it, but you can easily do it as an exercise, that this function f is increases and write continuous. But now look at this. We can write the set minus infinity b, for some b a real number, as minus infinity a union a b. Obviously, we're assuming that a is smaller than b. Basically, what we're doing is, if this is b and this is a, then minus infinity b would be this interval minus infinity a would be this other interval and a b is obviously this interval right here. So we're saying I can write the blue interval as the union of the green interval plus the pink one. And so this gives us that we can write the interval AV as this interval, so the minus infinity V, minus this other one, the minus infinity A. And so mu the measure of the interval a v is equal to the measure of this first interval minus the measure of the second interval. And because of how our function f is defined, so remember, f of x is the measure of the minus infinity x. So then, this first term is f of b, and the second term is f of a. So the measure of the interval a v is equal to f of b minus f of a. So this is what we will do. We will construct measures from functions f that are increasing and right continuous. And to do this, we will be using these kinds of intervals. So we will use what are called the h intervals, that are intervals of the form minus infinity a for some number a in the real numbers, a infinity, and obviously the empty set. So these are the three types of H-intervals, and it turns out that 
if I call A to the set of finite disjoint unions of H intervals, then it turns out that this set A is an algebra. And with all this, we are ready to define a pre-measure. This proposition says that we have a function in the real numbers that's increasing and right continuous, so the kind of function we just work with, and we have a sequence of disjoint H intervals, then we can define this function mu sub zero of the union up to n, so this is a finite. We can define the mu zero as the sum, the finite sum of f in the right extreme of the interval minus f in the left extreme. So it's basically what we did in the motivation. We define this function like this. And obviously, mu sub zero of the empty set to be zero because otherwise it wouldn't be anything. And we have this result. Mu zero is a pre measure. And this is great because once we have a pre measure, we already know we can construct measures. And it's defined on the algebra A. So the proposition gives us a pre measure. From the pre-measure, we can define an outer measure. We can then use that outer measure to define a measure. So basically, because this pre-measure is defined with a function f, then we can say that the function is defining the measure. Because it can be proven that given a function, the measure defined with all these things I just said is unique. And obviously, from Karachadori's theorem, we know that that measure that exists with all this construction is complete. So, actually, Borel measures, we will see that satisfy certain regularity properties. They are very easy and nice to work with, so we will actually care a lot about them. But so, what I said is that given a function f, we can define a measure mu. And this measure mu is complete. This measure mu then is defined on a sigma algebra m to the zero infinity. And what happens is that this sigma algebra m contains the Borel sets. And now, given an f, we have a measure. And these type of measures are called Lebesgue Stilsch's measures associated to the function f. And we denote it by m to the domain of the function of the measure mu. So if we take a set E, an element in the sigma algebra, then the measure of that set E is defined with all the construction we've done as the infimum of the sums from j equals 1 up to infinity of f of b sub j minus f of a sub j's, where b sub j and f sub j are numbers that satisfy that e can be covered by the union of the h intervals a sub j, b sub j from j equals 1 up to infinity. So this is how we define the Lebesgue Stilsch's measure associated to a function f. And here is where that function f appears. If you haven't already, check out our Patreon page. We have amazing perks for our subscribers. Just by paying $5 a month, you have exclusive content. So if you haven't already, Make sure you click that link in the description of the video to check it out.